Hey everybody, I'm Andy B. If you look through my uploads long enough, you might notice I like to talk about Sum 41. Sum 41. Sum 41. Sum 41. Sum 41. Sum 40. You also might notice I like to talk about animated shows. Let's talk about Fillmore, The Weekenders. My life, me. Oh no, this is horrible! Well, in this video, you're getting a bit of both worlds as we take a look at an animated show that featured Sum 41. Oh, and some other Canadian band, but we'll get to them later. This is Kevin Spencer. Kevin Spencer is a Canadian adult animated series created by Greg Lawrence. It originally ran on the Comedy Network from October 1998 to December 2005. Unlike a lot of the other obscure shows I talk about, Kevin Spencer had a surprisingly long run. It had a total of 112 episodes spanning 8 seasons. I assume it's because the show was cheap to produce. Also, Canadian broadcast laws require that a certain amount of Canadian programming be aired on Canadian networks. Because I don't know, I guess they need something to put on between reruns of Corner Gas. The show stars Kevin Spencer, a 14-year-old chain-smoking, alcoholic, cough syrup addicted, sociopathic, juvenile delinquent. We follow him and his trashy family through their daily misadventures and poorly animated antics. But I'm not here to talk about the entire series, I'm here to talk about one particular episode from Season 7 featuring beloved Canadian punks, Sum 41. And some other Canadian band, but like I said, we'll get to them later. So without much further delay, let's take a look at the episode, Treble Charger. Kevin wins a contest to appear on the Toon TV show Hangin', where one lucky kid gets to hang out with a band for a day. Kevin is excited because he figures a rock band ought to have tons of booze and slutty groupies, and he gets a chance to get away from his parents, and that alone makes it worth it. These are Kevin's parents, Percy and Anastasia. And simply put, they're trashy people who say stupid things in irritating voices. Who the fuck woke me up? Come here, snapper, I'm always getting arrested on TV again! I guess that's one thing Kevin has over his parents, he doesn't have a grating voice. In fact, we never hear his voice at all. All of Kevin's thoughts and dialogue are expressed by this mild-mannered Canadian narrator, voiced by creator Greg Lawrence himself. Kevin wasn't much of a morning person, so he pulled a homemade shank on the people that had woken him up and was fixing on stabbing them all. Anyway, Kevin's parents don't want him traveling alone, so they're allowed to go with him. And so the whole family sets out for Toronto to meet the band. It's at this point one of the episode's major problems becomes apparent. Kevin's family is way too similar to each other. They're effectively slight variations on the same character type, and it makes for a flat, uninteresting dynamic. Sure, there are slight differences between the characters, like Kevin having a narrator and being slightly more functional, Annie being a floozy, and Percy being the biggest drunk of the three. But they're all cut from the same beer-soaked, unhygienic, drug-addicted cloth. Really, a bulk of this episode's humor stems from Kevin and his family being scumbags. And much like these main characters, it's shallow and gets old really fast. Where is my car? Oh my god, you just pissed your pants! Did that excite you? But nobody cares about some crappy, deranged family. You want to hear about the band they're going to see. And as you might have guessed by this point, the band in question is not some 41. What?! Aside from my not-so-subtle foreshadowing, the title of the episode might have tipped you off. Now, some 41 do appear in the episode, with each of the members voicing their animated counterparts. But the headline band that the episode is named after is, in fact, Treble Charger. And now, for those who don't know, allow me to spend the next minute or so talking to you about Treble Charger. Because when else am I going to get this opportunity? Treble Charger was formed in 1992 in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Although the band's first few records had a softer alternative sound, at the turn of the millennium and with their fourth record, Wide Awake Board, the band adopted more of a pop-punk sound, and the style they're most well known for. They were also well known for their relation to another Canadian band you might have heard of, as their co-frontman Greg Norrie was a manager and producer for Sum 41 for many years, contributing to the band's three most classic albums. But getting back to the Treble Charger discography, Wide Awake Board was certified platinum in Canada and featured two well-charting singles, Brand New Low and what's considered to be their signature track, American Psycho. This one record even landed them a spot on Billboard's list of the top 150 best-selling Canadian artists. Granted, it was number 148, but still, they charted. Personally, I like Treble Charger, particularly their 2000s output, with their 2002 record Detox being my favorite from the band. Their melodic guitar leads and solos are a cut above your average pop-punk band, and they retain elements of their alternative origins on a number of tracks. Some of my personal favorites from the record are Ideal Waste of Time, The First Time, and Drive.
If you're a pop punk fan who hasn't heard Detox or even Wide Awake Bored, I definitely recommend them. Underrated pop punk records, in my opinion. Now, as much as I enjoy talking about punk bands of the Canadian variety, I do have an episode to review, so let's get back to Kevin Spencer. Somewhere in Toronto, we see Treble Charger talking with some 41 and awaiting Kevin's arrival. Maybe I'm biased because I like the band, but honestly, my favorite part of this episode is just hearing some 41 half acidly deliver their lines. Especially Derek. Gee whiz, I don't think anything that helps you connect with your fans is bullshit. Those sons of bitches! Are you seeing anyone? Fuck the fans. I know Cone does. <laughs> Have fun babysitting, guys. <laughs> The Spencers finally arrive in Toronto and they're about to start filming the show. But the cameraman wants to quit because he can't stand being around Kevin's mom. I don't blame him. But the show's host, Pepper, isn't too pleased. Just give me the camera and I'll do it myself. I'm freelance. This is my camera and you can go to hell. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't have to take your crap, lady. He's freelance. <laughs> With the cameraman gone, they can't record the show. But Kevin demands to get his prize or else he'll say that the band touched him. And so the band complies. While Kevin's excited to experience the rock star lifestyle, Kevin's mom is interested in other things, as she plans to get knocked up by one of the band members and then milk them for child support. I don't mind pulling no train if it helps you out, except that guy, fucking drummer. What alternate dimension does this take place in where drummers are considered uncool? Isn't stereotypically the bass player the loser of the band? Well, apparently not, because they portray Cone as being this groupy slamming stud. Sometimes my decorating ideas just come together. Sounds like me and every groupie I've had sex with. You know, I'm starting to think this episode was written by a bass player as a power fantasy after years of neglect. Because Jessica didn't care if you could play Shizm backwards, she was going to the prom with Johnny, Lord of the Phil's Fullerton, drummer from Thundersmith. Well, you know what, Jessica? I didn't even want to take you to prom. You're shallow, you're insensitive, and why don't you return my calls anymore? I just want my records back. Okay, you get the point. Before we continue with the plot, I want to talk about this episode's release date, because it honestly surprised me. Judging from Derek's spiky hair and the fact that Treble Charger are considered a popular band, I assume this episode came out sometime in late 2002, maybe early 2003. But in reality, this episode first aired on October 31st, 2004, two and a half weeks after Sum 41 released Chuck and way past the peak of Treble Charger's popularity. So what gives? Did they travel to an alternate dimension where it's always 2002? Is it the same dimension where drummers are apparently uncool? Drums are just as valid an instrument as any other. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the case is, taking the release date into account just makes this appearance that much more bizarre. This might be a good time to mention, this episode has a subplot involving Percy wanting to kill the band Chilliwack. What's a Chilliwack anyway? Some band. Ma thought their music was a crime against humanity. This subplot ultimately goes nowhere. Halfway through the episode, Percy steals the wallet of Treble Charger's manager so he can impersonate him and buy airline tickets. He then heads for the airport, but eventually blows his cover and then runs away. I, I, I mean, I, meaning me, not Percy, Dave, Dave, I, I'd fly out west to kill all the members of the band Chilliwack. I mean business. No, pleasure. Fuck. Why did I do that? That's as far as this subplot goes. We don't even get to see any of the members of Chilliwack or hear any of their music, which is apparently so bad, it can make a man want to kill them. I swear, the only reason they have this subplot in the episode is just to get rid of the manager character, because the police eventually arrest him thinking he was the one at the airport making death threats. I, I didn't do that. Save it for the judge. With their manager out of the picture, Kevin and his mom try to take control of Treble Charger in the only way they know how. Go find some drugs if we keep these fuckers drunk and stoned and we can control them. So the guys in Treble Charger become alcoholics, Kevin's mom has sex with everyone in the band, including the drummer, and Sum 41 attempt to out-party Treble Charger. It doesn't go well. Now we're at the Junos, and Sum 41 and Treble Charger are set to perform. We see Pepper again, this time reporting on the event, and hey look, the cameraman's back! For no explained reason. Ah, oh, but you know what? He can do what he wants. He's freelance. <laughs> Sum 41 are set to play first, but they're too wasted to perform, so Treble Charger gets moved up in the lineup. Unfortunately, they're also incredibly wasted, and their performance sucks. Not even Kevin's extraordinary one-finger keyboard playing could save it. For the final scene of the episode, we see the Spencers back at home watching Treble Charger on TV, talking about their lives after parting with the Spencers. 
Yeah, it was a long and horrible road back from addiction, but once we got the Spencers out of our lives, we were able to sober up. Honestly, we're just excited about our new album and happy that we came through it all and we've gotten our careers back on track. Yeah, I bet a lot of people were, but it's been 19 years since Detox, Greg. I hate to say it, but I think the hype's long since been dead. But I digress. Treble Charger gets clean, Kevin's mom gets made fun of for sleeping with a drummer, <laughs> and then the episode ends. And that was the Treble Charger episode of Kevin Spencer featuring Sum 41. And yeah, it wasn't very good. The animation is stiff and cheap, the writing is shallow and repetitive, and overall it's just uninteresting. This episode is one of the worst kinds of bad, and that's the boring kind. Sure, I've seen shows that have pissed me off more, but at least I was interested in talking about them. Had it not been for the fact that Sum 41 and Treble Charger appear in an episode, I wouldn't have given this show the time of day. But out of curiosity, I watched a few other episodes. After all, the Treble Charger episode was from season 7 out of 8, and I wanted to get a feel for the earlier seasons of the show. And yeah, it's pretty much more the same. Crude writing, bland characters, it's first-rate airtime filler. The biggest difference I saw was in the show's animation, which slowly changed over the 8 seasons. Yes, the footage you've been seeing throughout this review is actually Kevin Spencer's improved animation. This is what the show used to look like. So it effectively went from an MS Paint flipbook to a two-star Newgrounds animation. I mean, it is an upgrade, just in a really small, basically insignificant way. In conclusion, I guess you could consider this appearance an interesting footnote in Sum 41 and Treble Charger history. However, I feel it's a footnote best left forgotten. And with that, we've reached the end. So as per usual, I'm Andy B, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if I make another, I'll see you then. Take it easy.